we've been discussing the fact that this intuition is very, very strange <laughs> in, in, involving how to yeah. think about um, spaces of the type that Einstein and Minkowski and Poincaré were considering. Yes. Um, how does that begin to lead us towards these uh, more speculative ideas of yours surrounding complex numbers and the Twister program? I don't think many people, uh, many many of them may have heard of it, but yeah. even in uh, even in mathematics, you have to know that you got you were sort of seen as leading a cult. It had its own <laughs> newsletter, its own bizarre drawings. It was very difficult to communicate to members of the Twister cult because they didn't speak like other people. Well, we had this Twister newsletter, which was a. Uh, it started off by it's just in handwriting, and it was duplicated, and then. Let's not go into that for the moment. Oh, very good. Talk about the basic, the origin of Twister Theory, if you like. How, where did it come from? It was is really... Is this, in fact, your big bet in physics, do you think? Yeah, I think so. Well, you see, it's between that and the cosmology. But the cosmology is a bit different because it's not such a... Okay, it's a wild idea. Yeah. But it's not a whole body of wild ideas, which Twister Theory more is. All right. Um. But it has lots of connections with mathematics, as pure mathematics, and connections with physics. Let, let me describe the basis of it, because I think we've got most of the things we need. You see, the light cone describes how, from a one point or one event in space-time, all the different points of zero distance from it, or in other words, all the light rays from that point. Now... Let me think about it the other way around. That is my past light cone. So I'm sitting at a certain point in space-time, and I look out at the universe, and all the light rays that get to me at a particular instant, moment of my time, come along this past light cone. So that's, imagine this cone stretching out into the past and getting bigger and bigger as it goes back in time. And that's all the, the events which are... In one moment of my time, I, I see those events. So I see a lot of stars in the sky. Now let's suppose that, I mean, the stars in the sky look like points, you see, so that you have the sphere, the celestial sphere, which is um, my field of vision, if I'm sort of imagining myself out in So space. imagine that the Earth was transparent, so you weren't... That's one way, or just get, let's go out into space, and I can, I can be looking at the, the world all around me. Now let's imagine that an, another astronaut comes whizzing past me at nearly the speed of light. And just as we pass each other, he looks, he or she looks out at the sky at the same moment as I do. Now, because of a phenomenon known as aberration, the stars will be slightly not in the same place with regard to that astronaut as me. Um, the sky is somewhat distorted. But it's distorted in a very particular way, which is what's called conformal. Uh, to way, say this in a simple way, suppose I happen to see a configuration of stars that happen to be on a circle. Suppose they were concyclic. And then this astronaut passing by me would also see these in a circle. Even though the transformation would not be a rotation of the sphere, sky, it would be squashed up more on one end and stretched out at the other end. But the thing about that transformation, it's something which I knew about from my complex analysis days. Do you think of the what's called the Riemann sphere? This is the, the plane of points. You think the complex plane or the vessel plane are the point play the points represent the complex numbers. So zero is in the middle, if you like, and then you've got one, and then you've got minus one. And I and minus I, they're all in a circle. And you go out, and infinity is way out to infinity. But the Riemann sphere folds all this up into a sphere. So infinity is now point. So it's a little bit like if you have a, if you have a caramel coating around an apple, you're folding that You disc fold it around, that's right. And at the point where the stick would go into the apple, all of the boundary of that uh, candy would come together. Yes. And it's what's called a stereographic projection. You can project from the North Pole and all the other points flatten out into the plane. So you can see all the points on the sphere except for the point from which you're projecting. Exactly. And that's called a stereographic projection. And it has this remarkable property that it sends circles to circles. Or you could say it's conformal. That is, angles are preserved. 
And it's a very beautiful transformation. I used to play around with these things just for fun often. Now, the thing is that the transformations of this sphere to itself, which preserve the angles, is also transformation which is what's called analytic or holomorphic. It's, it's the most smooth transformation you can have. So, so just the analog of smooth but for it's complex analog, objects exactly. rather than real objects. That's so right. Where real and complex means the types of numbers. Yes, that's right. So it's, so it's what, what smooth is in complex analysis. And those transformations which send the sphere to the sphere are exactly those in relativity. So the different observers passing me at different speeds, looking at the same sky, the map from my sky to their skies is exactly these complex transformations of the sphere. And this actually is what you exactly get when you use two component spinners. And you see the description when you move from one observer to another is exactly those ones which transform the sky in this conformal way to itself. And often people find this puzzling. I find it puzzling originally, because suppose you had a, a sphere which is whizzing, you know, an alien spaceship, which is a sphere, shooting past you at nearly the speed of light. Well, you see, the direction of motion, it will be contracted by the Lorentz contraction. So when you look at it, you should see it sort of flattened out. You don't, because a sphere goes, a circle goes to a circle. If you see it as a circle when it's not moving, you'll still see it as a circle. I mean, the boundary of the thing will look like a circle when it is moving. And you, you work, work away and think about it. Well, you see where the light rays go and the front of it and the back of it and all that. And you see, really, you don't see the flattening. It really it does look like, a, like a, a circle. Its boundary looks like a circle. So I wrote a paper on this. Almost sim simultaneously, there was a, uh, somebody else wrote a paper on mainly thinking of the small circles and spheres. Um, but this transformation, that was really what started me now, off. If I understand correctly, maybe I don't. Yeah. Um, we have another mutual acquaintance, a uh, friend, Raoul Bott. And yes. <laughs> he showed us that the world seems to repeat every eight dimensions in a certain way. Yeah. But during the first cycle of what you might call bot periodicity from zero to seven or one to eight, depending upon how you like to count, yeah, yeah. you get these things called low dimensional coincidences. Oh, yes. That's and right. so yes, yes. That, that they don't recur because of your point earlier about spinners, that spinners grow yes. exponentially, whereas vectors grow linearly. That's right. And But during the first period where these things are of comparable strength, yes. you get all of these... Um, objects where depending upon you define in two different contexts, you turn out to be the same object. That's right. Are, you're making use of that here? It is that. It's the, uh, well, the Lorentz group. Or like, you know, that the yeah. rotations of space and time, which we might call SO13 or SO13 double cover, yeah. would be equal to something else called SL2C, that's which right. would mention complex numbers, even though there's no complex numbers to be seen in right. space yeah. and time. Yeah, it depends on that, that one of those coincidences. Well, it's triple coincidence, I think. <laughs> you certainly get All a the coincidence there, um, which one is depending upon in this description. But the point I'm making here is that in a certain sense, relativity is described when you do it in the two-spinner form, which is really expressed in this fact that... It's the transformation of the Riemann sphere to itself, which is a complex transformation. This is the most general transformation of the sphere to itself when you think of that sphere as a Riemann sphere. So it's a complex one-dimensional space. You might say, surely it's two-dimensional. Well, it's two-dimensional in real numbers, but one-dimensional in complex numbers because the complex, each complex number carries the information of two real numbers. So for example, mathematicians would call what most people call the complex plane, they might call it a complex line. It's a complex line, that's right. Yeah, and so the language again is uh, intended to make things very hostile to the newbie. <laughs> yes, well, it's, that's true. But you have to get used to the idea that when you're thinking complex, when you think of it sort of really, sort of concretely in, in the real terms, that you have to double the number of real dimensions to get the number of complex dimensions. I want my audience to I mean, work, half but half I don't want them to feel stupid for making yeah. the mistake that every single around, person yeah. makes. <laughs> you have the number, of course. So we have the complex numbers, 
playing a fundamental role in relativity. That's the really point I want to make. And it's the complex sphere. Sorry, the Riemann sphere, which is this one-dimensional, in, in complex sense, two-dimensional in the real sense, object, which is fundamental. Now, this Riemann sphere appears in the most basic way in quantum mechanics, too. You think of the, the, a spin. Now, that's the, practically the most direct complex the most direct quantum mechanical thing, in a certain sense, where you see quantum mechanics playing a real role as quantum mechanics, which is hard to grasp normally, but you can see it here. It's, the geometry really works. You see, if you have a, an object of a spin half, that's the smallest non-zero spin you can have, such as an electron. So think of an electron, it has spin half. Now, what that means is that it's basically two states of spin, which people call spin up and spin down. Well, what does that mean? Right hand, you put your thumb up like that. Right-handed spin is where your fingers go, and that's spin up means right-handed about up. Spin down is right-handed about down, and that's left-handed about up. And those are the two basic states. But what's special about up and down? Nothing. So you think of what about right, left, forwards, backwards. All those are combinations of up and down. And they're combinations through these complex numbers which lie at the basis of quantum mechanics. But here you can see in a visual way what they're doing. You see, you can say up, down, what's left and right? Well, these are com combinations of up and down. So you add this much of up to that much of down and you get to the, to the right. Right. And, and you minus it, you get to the left, or I times, and you get forwards or back, whatever it is. And the complex numbers come in to describe these possible directions of spin. And it's the Riemann sphere, again. So you, but you're relating these complex numbers of quantum mechanics to the directions in space. So you have a connection between these rather abstract numbers, which are fundamental to quantum mechanics, and the much more concrete picture of the directions in space. Well, but but Roger, I think you're both. <laughs> well, let me be, challenge you slightly. Ever challenge so slightly. <laughs> Go on. Yes. What you're really talking about is a very important fork in the road for physics. Yes. Do you m wed yourself to the world that we're actually given? And you know, Mach was famous for having said this phrase: "The world is given only once." <laughs> and so we happen to know that there does exist a world that appears to be well modeled by three spatial and one temporal dimension. And then the key question yeah. is, do you wish to have a more general theory, which think, works in all dimensions or which works for all different divisions between how many spatial and how many temporal dimensions? And what I see you as having done, which I think is incredibly noble, brave, and scientifically valid, is to work with mathematics that are really particular particularizing themselves to the world we're given rather than sort of keeping some kind of, I mean, like you're getting married to the world we live in, in a way that other people are just dating it and wishing to keep their <laughs> options open. I think you've hit on a very crucial point. Absolutely right. I mean, for example, with string theory and all that, people talk about 26 dimensions or 10 spatial dimensions or 11 or 12 and things like that. And sure, the mathematics, we've got mathematics to handle these things. And maybe that's important to the way the world works. But I was never attracted by that for basically two reasons. One was the reason I'm just trying to describe here, and it's exactly what you're saying, that I'm looking for a way in which you find a mathematics to describe the world which is very particular to the dimensionality we see. So the three space dimensions and one time dimension is described in this formalism very directly. And if you're going to try and talk about other numbers of dimensions of space and time, it doesn't work. Well, as much as I really like to stick it to the string theorists, <laughs> okay. that's not exactly their problem either. Because well, 26 is really because yes. it's two more than 24. And 10 is really because it's two more than eight. And in eight, you have something special called triality. Yes. And so what they were really doing was figuring out how to build different theories around different highly specific yeah. targets. 
But you see, there it's the beauty in the mathematics, which, sure, once is a good guide. But it has to be... Well, they play I mean, with so toy th theories and they never grow up to playing with reality. That's the sort of thing. I mean, it's, it's perfectly good to explore all these different things and it's very valuable. But I'm trying to follow a route which is viewed, I think, in many quarters as very narrow. I'm looking for a route which is, works specifically for the number of space-time dimensions that we have. And is, if, I mean, there are aspects of twister theory which do work in other dimensions, but they run out very quickly. And you can see analogs of these things, but they're kind of... The well, this is sort of a strong version of the anthropic principle, which is that <laughs> if there weren't a beautiful mathematics to, to catch you, I mean, in some sense, despite the fact that you're in your late 80s, it's like you're stage diving at a punk concert where you're kind of hope that the mathematics catches you because you're willing to actually marry at a very deep level the world that we do observe. And I find that what mm. what's very disturbing to me um, is that the yeah. political economy of science mm. means that fewer people are willing to make strong speculations, strong predictions, to explore things that don't give them the flexibility in case things that don't work out to say, um, well, it could be like this, it could be like that. And so in part, I see you as part of a dying breed of people who are willing to go down with a ship for the privilege of commanding it as its captain. Well, you can view it that way if you like. My claim is that the ship isn't actually sinking. You might think it no, is. No, no, no. I'm not, I'm not claiming <laughs> that. I, I think that one of the things that that's happened is, has been that yours has been one of the most important idiosyncratic programs that, in fact, got a huge lease on life from the fact that it has positive externalities. Because it was absolutely solid mathematics, it turned out that even if it doesn't give us a fundamental description of the world, it is at least a deep insight into um, how to transform one problem into another to allow solutions that wouldn't have been easily gleaned in the, in the original formulation. 